Four of South Korea's kippos, or tidal mudflats, have been recognized as a universal natural asset for humanity. Inscribed as a UNESCO World Natural Heritage Site, the most prestigious of all conservation designations. These wetlands serve as vital habitats and breeding grounds for millions of species, including endangered water birds, such as oyster catchers, hooded cranes and marine and invertebrates. As major ecosystems, they also help prevent coastal erosion, improve people's health and well-being, and offer so much more than we know. Today, we discuss Korea's tidal flats and how they are a vital asset that must be protected for the future of the planet. And for this, we speak with Mertild Rosa, director of the World Heritage Center at UNESCO, and we also connect with South Korea's leading marine biologist, Park Jin-sun, professor of maritime studies and dean of ocean science at Korea Maritime and Ocean University. A very warm welcome to you both. Thank you so much for joining us. Um, well, to go straight into the question, starting with you, Director Rosa. Now, you're in the city where um, you made this decision to inscribe Korea's uh, tidal flats into the natural heritage site, I believe. And, well, it was a big moment for Korea and also a big moment for um, conservationists and uh, biologists everywhere. And really, um, while Korea's tidal flats, they were previously um, set to be instated as World Heritage Sites by the International Union for Conservation of Nature, only for the decision to be deferred earlier this year. So what made the World Heritage Committee overturn this deferral this July and uh, make Korea's tidal flats a World Heritage Site? Indeed, the discussions here at the 44th session of the World Heritage Committee were quite intense, but I think the committee recognized the high level of biodiversity at the site with more than 2,100 species of flora and fauna in this tidal flat. And I think it's uh, also because of the flyways, um, because uh, Getball is located at the Eastern Yellow Sea, and it has a, quite a complex combination of geological, oceanographic, and climatological uh, conditions that have led to the development of um, a coastal um, sedimentary system which is very um, diverse. And I think that the World Heritage Committee recognized that. And also the links between this geodiversity and biodiversity. And I think uh, it's very important for the people uh, to see these links between cultural and natural uh, diversity. And it is in this sense that this is also um, linked to the identity of the people here in Korea. And now, Professor Park, uh, we just saw a lot of um, different species on the footage there. And well, what are the rare animals and the kind of species that can be found in Korea's kippos and how should they be protected? Well, actually, there are so many of the such species. Uh, so I will just name only a few in this time. Uh, first of all, the most rare and endangered animal uh, which can be found in Korean tidal flat would be the spoon-billed uh, sand piper. Uh, which is a very small migratory bird. Uh, in Korean, it's nopjok buridoyo. Its total population is no more than 1,000 in the world, which means that they are very near to the extinction, actually. Uh, another rare bird which the Korean tidal flat is a black-faced spoonbill. Uh, in Korean, it's jose. It's a highly endangered species worldwide, with most of its population reproducing in Korean coast. Uh, besides birds, there are also many beautiful and rare invertebrates. For example, there is a large marine worms, large marine worm species, uh, polychid, uh, called as Hidipal Chamgitjirogi in Korean, which actually grows up to two meters in size, very big. And of crabs are also uh, designated as a species for protection. Well, the main reason for these uh, animals uh, to decline in number is the decrease of the tidal flats, mainly due to reclamation in the past times. Thus, protection of the tidal flat is the protection of such rare and endangered animals, I think. Thank you. And well, uh, Director Rosler, you said that both the natural and cultural heritage are important to the identity of the people. So in terms of the heritage of the tidal flats of Korea, what do you see as an important aspect of the flats? And also, how does that tie into the identity of Koreans? 
I really think that, um, as Professor Park mentioned, uh, it is very important this site uh, because we have 118 migratory bird species. And I think people relate to nature and uh, beyond the, uh, the national borders. So uh, it is along the flyway and that links people together. Um, but I think that um, all the wetlands here is very important for the people. It's the biodiversity and the ecosystem services which is critical, but people relate to nature. So it's these linkages between um, people and nature, which, are very, which is very important. And um, I think it is in this sense that GetBall is also important uh, for the people of Korea. And Professor Park, during your research, you found a very uh, original Korean uh, genus in Korea's tidal flats. Could you tell us more about this and how unique the biodiversity of Korean tidal flats um, is? Yes, uh, I found the Morenes in from Korea, uh, Korean tidal flats. Uh, the genus Morenes is belonging to a small microscopic algae called this diatom. Diatoms are major primary producers growing in tidal flats. It's like a gra uh, grasses in terrestrial environments. They are also food for many animals, such as polychaetes, crabs, small fishes, and sometimes even for certain small microbes actually eat those diatoms. I have encountered the genus Morenes uh, during my master courses, but at that time, I could not match it to any of the known genus reported from Europe, America, and other places uh, because it has uh, such unique features. The name of the genus, Morenes, uh, actually came from the Korean word more, which means uh, sand, because the genus was found from sand flats in Semangum Tard flat, which is now just reclaimed and vanished. Uh, based on my experience and also of my colleagues, about 30, to even 40% of diatoms from Korean tidal flats would be new species or even new genus, surprisingly. Uh, I also have experienced that uh, scientists from Germany and Poland expressed their surprise to me that uh, about the such a high diversity and unique of, of the animals and diatoms living in Korean tidal flats. Yes. And just uh, seeing how uh, these ecosystems are flourishing, it's quite amazing to uh, see all the benefits they have to offer. And well, Director Rosler, what are some ecosystem services that Tidal Flats offer? I think uh, the World Heritage Committee really recognized that um, the Korean Tidal Flats um, uh, have an outstanding island type uh, flat uh, ecosystem. Uh, because of these unique geological and geomorphological um, processes. And there are fast currents which uh, change direction every six hours, which run between the different islands uh, through the channels. And that creates a hugely diverse uh, geomorphology, um, including the world's thickest uh, intertidal mudflat sediments, uh, which de uh, deposit during the uh, Holocene period. And such a complex geological environment, um, as Professor Park just said, uh, with dynamic hydrological systems, that promotes a great productivity and led to a very unique evolution of the different uh, communities there. Well, Professor Park, actually earlier this month, the uh, result of your joint research was published in the Science of the Total Environment, which found that 20 tidal flats in Korea actually managed to absorb 30 million tonnes of carbon between 2017 and 2020. And well, that's roughly the equivalent of emissions found from um, 110,000 vehicles a year. So in other words, a lot. So, well, how vital are tidal flats to the environment and how can we really maximise the use of these flats to um, advance our climate change mitigation efforts? Well, it, to put in the notion, uh, tidal flats is very, very crucial when it, uh, are coping with the like, climate, climate change issues, also the, not only the bio, biodiversity. Uh, the very issue you mentioned is called as blue carbon, which means that the carbon store is by, by coastal habitat, uh, such as salt marsh, mangrove, seagrass beds, and others. Well, as far as I know, IPCC, uh, Intergovernmental 
developmental panel on climate change also recognized this issue, blue carbon, as quite seriously. As we mentioned, uh, there has been research on blue carbon capacity of Korean tide flats. It was actually the first study of its kind in national scale. Uh, internationally, blue carbon of tide flats uh, without vegetation uh, have attracted little attention so far compared to other coastal habitats, uh, for example, salt marsh and mangrove. But a uh, study by Seoul National University have shown that tidal flats, whether they are vegetated, which means uh, there are growing plants or not, uh, have good blue carbon capacities, capacities. This is another good reason uh, for the restoration and management of tidal flats. Well, Efforts to increase of tidal flats will be in turn increase of blue carbon capacity of Korea. And vegetation is also important uh, because tidal flats with the halophytes uh, shows much higher blue carbon capacities. Okay. In this regard, again, uh, restoration of estuarine tidal flat is very important because they are often more suitable for the growth of halophytes like leaves and others. Of course, uh, biodiversity issue and productivity is also extremely important. So we have to really uh, keep this tidal flats very well. Thank you. And well, Professor Park, um, active efforts to restore tidal flats in Korea uh, seem to have begun in 2010 and in 2020 last year, a tidal flat law actually went into effect. And this was aimed to preserve, restore and uh, manage these uh, tidal flats. But why do we keep seeing these wetlands disappearing? I mean, uh, what are the biggest challenges to preserving and managing them? That's a good question. And... Okay, I would like to mention Semangum project here. Uh, although it began in early 90s, the project itself is still going on with uh, much social concerns and controversies. Huge area of uh, tidal flats are now uh, simply fast parents in there, and once the drive arrives, just all perished. Maybe this is the reason why many people think that uh, tidal flats are still largely disappearing disappearing, I mean. But in fact, uh, reclamation in large scale is not going on anymore in Korea. Uh, maybe some exceptions are just a small scale project in practical demands, like uh, for the management of fish reports and others. This attests us that we need to consider many uh, social stakeholders when we are to deal with the protection, restoration and management of tidal flat. Uh, of course, this is not easy task and Korean government introduced the so-called marine spatial planning uh, to tackle this issue. And I think this is the right direction, although there would be some trial and errors uh, for better practice of the, uh, the very politics, I mean. Active restorations are also to be made, of course, to counteract the historical loss of Korean tidal flats, which is about up to 44% of whole uh, Korean tidal flats uh, in historically. And Dr. Rosler, well, at the rate that uh, we're currently facing uh, climate change, it's an incredibly difficult task to preserve world heritage sites and also leave them in good shape for future generations. What are some of the major challenges in preserving the sites and what are some ways that we can really raise awareness among the younger generation regarding the preservation of these sites? Indeed, this is really a big issue now. Um, climate change is the biggest threat uh, to uh, natural world heritage sites uh, globally. And at this session here in Fuzhou, we have um, adopted uh, an adapted uh, climate change policy on world heritage which will um, go to the meeting of 194 state parties which have ratified the World Heritage Convention. And uh, this policy addresses states, uh, but also site managers and all of us. And I think this is a, a very good way forward uh, also to raise awareness uh, among the young people, because the idea of the World Heritage Convention is that we protect those places which are the most outstanding places on earth, not for us, 
but for the future generations. And we had also here in Fuzhou a forum of young professionals. So they are extremely interested in protecting World Heritage Sites. So I am very positive that um, we managed to have a positive outlook forward. Well, this is where we have to leave it for today. That was Mertil Rosler, Director of the World Heritage Centre at UNESCO and Professor Park Jin Sun, Professor of Maritime Studies um, and Ocean Sciences at Korea Maritime and Ocean University. Thank you both so much for your time. Thank, thank you. you very much. And to our viewers, as always, thank you very much for watching and have a lovely weekend wherever you are. Goodbye.